Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Nigel Chidombwe and I'm the head of the uh, commercial awareness with the legal MET. And uh, I'm here with Aksa Hassan. Aksa, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Aksa Hussein, as Nigel uh, put so nicely. Uh, I am a uh, lawyer in the UK, um, namely a barrister. I'm currently doing my third six, uh, which is sort of extended pupillage um, at a chambers called Number Five Chambers. I specialize in criminal and human rights law. So why did you decide to become a lawyer? What motivated you to do so? Uh, very good, very existential question, Nigel. Um, what motivated me to become a lawyer? I think before coming, so I never had any intentions of becoming a lawyer in life. I always thought um, the law, gross, full of bureaucracy, not interested. Um, and then I started working in fields like international development. Um, and I was sort of pursuing that during my undergraduate and my postgraduate degree. And I very quickly realized that it felt as if I wasn't doing anything tangible or had no tangible skill to offer um, in these fields. Um, and with that very naive understanding of what law was, I decided to pursue it. Um, so I did the graduate diploma in law here in the UK and then uh, did the bar course, which is a very specific training for barristers. Um, and that's sort of how I ended up in the law. Um, so not a, you know, I didn't come out of the womb hoping to be a lawyer, but uh, right now I'm very excited about being in the profession. Um, and then I decided to, of course, pursue criminal law and human rights law. Um, in the UK, at least, doing crime as a barrister is probably the area of law where you're in court the most. So I'm in court almost uh, every day of the week. Um, I'm constantly, you know, on my feet. I'm, I'm doing interesting cases, um, some not so interesting as well, because that's just the nature of the junior end of this profession. Um, but yeah, I'm just constantly doing advocacy and I absolutely love it. Um, and then, of course, the, I guess, human rights, more public side of law, uh, public law side of the law, um, at least at the junior end, feels like you're doing slight, slightly more strategic things. And you're thinking about how to challenge the government on certain policies or this certain ways they've implemented policies. And so I really enjoy that as well and the, the nice balance between the two. Yeah, I see you on Instagram. You're always in court and you're, you know, traveling to and from. I really follow that. <laughs> yeah, my Instagram, uh, which is called AXA, at AXA Wigging It, um, I think the name indicates uh, that it's not meant to be a serious account, but at the same time, what I'm trying to do with it is demystify this profession and kind of present the realities of what being in court on a day-to-day -day basis is like, what life as a criminal barrister is like, and what just the junior end of the bar is like. And I think, um, yeah, so far the response has been quite positive. And I think students and aspiring barristers have found it really interesting to see what the reality is like. Because I think when a lot of us apply to be a barrister um, or, or desire to be a barrister, we see all the sort of glamorous stuff, the Supreme Court stuff, the, the amazing cases when the reality is we're probably gonna be in the magistrate's court doing a lot of driving offenses for the first couple of years. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I like presenting that, um, that, that sort of side, that real side of pupillage and life at the junior end. So what inspired you to start Human Rights Pulse? Human Rights Pulse, gosh, um, I, it's, it's, it feels like such a long time ago it started, but the reality is it's been just over a year since we launched the platform. And initially, uh, why I wanted to start it was because I felt there wasn't a space for young professionals to grow in the human rights field. Often, if you want to write or be engaged in human rights work, you're expected to have, um, you know, like a thousand degrees, 20 PhDs, 50 years in the field, etc. And I sort of wanted to take all of that away and allow us young people, young professionals. Yes, Nigel, I still consider myself young. Um, but to have this space where we could essentially um, start building our expertise and start building a community um, whilst getting experts in to, to help us do that um, and to really focus on human rights issues that are important to us um, either in our own countries or based on our own experiences. Um, and so that was sort of the, 
idea behind starting Human Rights Pulse and over the last year I'm so proud to say we have over 300 writers from all over the world writing and contributing articles. We have a stellar team of editors, a social media team, you know, a completely online run organisation. We are a registered charity of 501c3, I think, uh, to, to, to be correct. Um, so it's all very exciting and we have so many interesting plans for the future as well. Yeah, and I'm one of those writers and I can say that it's a really brilliant platform. So what challenges have you encountered in running Human Rights Pass? Oh, in terms of challenges, I mean, I must say the pandemic hasn't had uh, the challenges that many organisations have faced simply because we've always been a Zoom based organisation from the day we started. Uh, my team is spread from everywhere from San Francisco to Hong Kong, you know, Brazil, um, where you're uh, in, so, currently in Cyprus, but from Zimbabwe, right? And, you know, we've got people in South Africa, Singapore, everywhere. So it's an incredibly global organization. So of course, we're, we've always been on Zoom. Um, in terms of the challenges, I guess it's been, for me at least, uh, managing this growing team. I think um, Human Rights Pulse grew at an unprecedented rate. I know we all hate the word unprecedented this year, but I'm going to use it. Um, you know, we, we just weren't expecting it to grow as fast as it did. And it's incredible to see what it's become. It's incredible to see how many people are engaging with it um, over the various social media platforms. And I think the biggest challenge for me personally has been managing that alongside managing also being a pupil barrister, which in itself is quite a demanding um, role. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's been sort of my personal challenge. Um, but for Human Rights Pulse itself, I guess, you know, we've always been trying to think about how do we keep bringing in a diverse group of writers? How do we keep diversifying the content that we have? How do we, you know, have an equal balance of, global, of voices from the global north, global south? How do we make our social media as engaging as possible? Because ultimately the goal for Human Rights Pulse is to create human rights content that is accessible, engaging and practical. And we're still working on all of that. Um, but as you all know, Nigel, being a part of it yourself, it is the sort of young community like everyone's very driven everyone's really passionate and so yeah i can only imagine where we will go in the next couple of years yeah that's very true on that where do you see human rights pass in the next five years um honestly i have no idea uh because in the last year we've grown so much and you know we are no longer just a an online blog if that's a you know, a, an easy way to put it, we are doing so much more than that. We're holding community sessions, we're ho holding little symposiums, we're getting the community involved with various projects. Um, we're starting initiatives, getting high schools involved um, from, again, across the world. Uh, we're making short movies. We are working, collaborating with other grassroots organizations across the world on uh, working on certain issues again, focus group issues to come up with practical solutions that we can offer to decision makers. Um, we've got a mobile app coming, which is I'm, something I'm very personally excited about. Um, but yeah, I, you know, th this is one of those organizations and, and I pride the fact, uh, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that Human Rights Pulse is an organization where it's just constantly growing and I very much have a, of the mindset that we need this constant trial and error and keep pushing boundaries and keep, you know, leveraging social media and technology in the best way possible um, to keep, try to continue achieving our goals, which is, like I said, to make accessible, engaging and practical content about human rights issues. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. So what advice would you give to young lawyers, law students who want to follow your, your, your career path, that want to follow the way that you have pursued the law? Well, I would definitely say, uh, you know, don't aim to follow somebody's career path. Uh, my career path is very unique to me, and it was a you know, a very roundabout way of ending up in the law. As I said, I was no diehard lawyer um hadn't had the, that burning urge to be a lawyer from my my youth um, and it just sort of happened and along the way is you know all those exciting 
things I did along the way, um, all those various work experiences, those encounters I had, those places I was able to travel. That's what, you know, that, that's what I look back on and think, wow, that was really exciting. And those experiences have shaped me and, and made me that cool and, I don't know, uh, cool, clever lawyer I am today, if that's a good, if those are good adjectives to use. Um, and so I would really recommend, you know, don't, obviously seek inspiration from looking at other people's journeys, ask people about their journeys, seek mentorship from people if you think their journey is something that either resonates with you or something that inspires you. But, you know, keep in mind that it's your journey at the end of the day as well. And you can, it can take any turn that you want as long as you have that sort of end goal in mind. Um, and if your end goal is to become a solicitor, a barrister, a lawyer, um, if you're in another country, um, just, yeah, keep that in mind, but be open, be open to doing lots of different things. I have work experience across industries, um, across various organisations, because I always said yes. And yeah, I guess that's one recommendation I would give, like, just always say yes. So um, do you think it's difficult for ethnic minorities to break into the legal field in the UK or what has been your experience? I mean, you know, Nigel, history would show that it has been difficult. Um, I'm very lucky because I haven't counted and encountered any obstacles because of my the colour of my skin. At least I don't think so. If I have, I'm clearly oblivious to it. Um, but you know, one thing I would say is I didn't grow up with lawyers in my family. I didn't grow up with prof lots of professional contacts. My parents, like many people of colour in at least the UK, you know, they came over as immigrants. They had to work hard. They sacrificed a lot for me, my siblings. And, you know, we are where we are today. It's a huge testament to them. I had to use a lot of initiative to get to where I am, a lot of persistence. I mean, my God, if I talk about persistence, I, I rate myself on that because I will send out emails. I will I will have a thousand doors shut on me. I don't mind if people say no, 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 because all I need is one person to say yes and one person to be my mentor and one person to help me take that next step and, and just know what to do. And so whilst I think, um, you know, being a person of colour hasn't hindered me um, to the extent that I think a lot of my peers in the profession might have experienced. I do think that I have been required to take far more initiative. Um, I feel like I have to be better um, than a lot of people um, who, who, may, who are not of colour, if that's a good way to say it. Um, and I just, um, yeah, I, I've had to seek mentorship in a way that probably a lot of people also haven't. Um, and it's just because of these good people who have been able to direct me and give me advice that I've been able to get to where I am and I'll forever be thankful to them. Um, there are lots of institutional factors which you know make it difficult for pe vain people, as you put it, to get into this profession. But I think with the right, with the right attitude, that initiative, that persistence, that grit, um, anything is possible. Okay, this is my last uh, question for you. Uh, okay. Do you have any internships or training contracts that have molded you to who you are today? Um, yes, so two spring to mind. Um, in 2012, so, okay, let me give you some context first. I started, uh, when, when I was at, in high school in my last couple of years, I focused on the sciences. And I was going to go to university to study biochemistry. Uh, but then I decided to take a gap year, much to the dismay of my secondary school and my parents. Um, and during this gap year, I discovered the social sciences world and human rights, namely, and, and what all of that means. Um, I learned about terms such as feminism and socialism and, you know, just like stuff I hadn't encountered because I was such a science student. Um, I did an internship during that gap year which was in 2012, a very long time ago, uh, with an organization called Invisible Children. And without going into too much I, about what the organization did, you should definitely Google them, they do excellent work. Um, but I essentially was able to go to the United States and travel across advocating for human rights issues 
um, namely human rights issues based in Central Africa concerning um, child soldiers and um, the the tagline essentially was ending Africa's longest running war with the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, and that was, you know, an internship I did and I absolutely loved it. I met some incredible people, both activists, survivors, um, just people working passionately in, in the policy world, in like, the advocacy world, etc. And it just opened my eyes to the, to, to the things that can be done if people mobilise and um, mobilize, organize, and just uh, have passion and determination. So that was incredible. Um, a second internship I did, uh, which turned into an actual part-time job, was during the university. So I did university in Amsterdam, and I worked for a strategy consulting um, organization. Um, and I, I got to see some incredible work uh, working with some really big sort of multinational organizations and charities um, and it was so interesting I mean first of all I realized I don't want to be in the corporate world it's not for me but the way they think and the way they frame things and the way they create opportunities out of almost nothing I thought that was so interesting and in my sort of year of doing that I learned so much so many invaluable skills and um, so again as you can see of, of course the first internship was you know, in the human rights world, but the second internship in, in the business world, and albeit it's not very relevant to what I do now, I picked up so many skills that have, you know, reframed them, they're transferable skills. So yeah, very grateful for all those opportunities. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and uh, we wish you the best in your legal career and hope to speak to you soon. Thank you so much, Nigel. Cheers.